The viol, often called the viola da gamba, was one of the most popular instruments in Renaissance and early Baroque Europe. In England, the viol held a special place in homes and palaces across the country. In this pre concert talk, we'll explore the origins of the viol, learn about the importance of the instrument in England, and dive into the lives of some of this episode's composers. When the Moors conquered the Kingdom of Aragon in the middle of the 13th century, they brought their culture with them. The Moorish influence on architecture can be seen throughout Spain. The Moorish influence on cuisine lasts to this day. And the Moorish influence on music paved the way for the development of the viol. The Moors brought many musical instruments with them to Spain. But one of their musical instruments, the rabab, began, became a central part of the Aragonese culture through the decades. The rabab and the European medieval fiddle both played with the instrument resting on the lap or between the legs, enjoyed several decades of use together. By the early 14th century, the medieval fiddle began to lose popularity. Bowed string instruments rested on the arm, like today's violin, would soon become more popular. However, according to scholar Ian Woodfield, in certain areas of the Kingdom of Aragon, the rabab never completely fell out of fashion. Depictions of the rabab can be seen in manuscripts dating from the late 14th century to the late 15th century. Of course, no origin story for an instrument is ever clear-cut. Often, there are multiple influences that affect the course of an instrument's development. That's no different for the viol. At some point in the 15th century, the rabab began to take on characteristics of a native Spanish instrument, the bihuela de mano. The bihuela de mano was a plucked instrument with slightly curved insides, similar to the modern guitar. Instrument makers in Valencia combined aspects of the rabab with the bihuela de mano to create a new hybrid instrument. The new instrument, called the bihuela de arco, or the bowed bihuela, would further develop into the viol that we know today. When Alonso Borgia, the Bishop of Valencia, was elected the next pope in 1455, he brought a large contingent of his countrymen to live and work in the papal household. Alonso appointed his nephew, Rodrigo Borgia, to fill his place as the next Bishop of Valencia. In 1492, Rodrigo was elected to the papacy. Like his uncle, Rodrigo brought his countrymen to work in the papal household. After Rodrigo began his reign, the Bihuela de Arco, once made in Valencia, began to appear more frequently in the Papal States. Now, it's impossible to know for certain if the Borgia family introduced the Bihuela de Arco into the Italian peninsula. After all, the Kingdom of Aragon included territory in Spain as well as ter territory on the Italian peninsula. It's possible that the Bihuela de Arco arrived in Italy through the influence of Aragonese culture. Even if the Borgia family did not introduce the Bihuela de Arco to Italy, their use of the instrument certainly had an impact. In the hands of Italian luthiers, the Bihuela de Arco would transform into the viol that we know today. Italian luthiers worked for decades to alter and refine the structure of the Bihuela de Arco into the vials that you'll see in this episode. Each new development of the viol created the need for more and more alterations. Between the 1490s and 1530s, Italian luthiers altered much of the Bihuela de Arco structure to create the viol. Italian luthiers changed the bridge from flat to curved. They added a bass bar and sound post to support the increased string tension. They changed the top of the instrument from flat to curved. The straight shoulders became sloping ones, and the flat back was turned inward at the top. The Bihuela de Arco probably made its first appearance at the Tudor court around 1501. This introduction was thanks to Catherine of Aragon, the wife of Prince Arthur Tudor, Henry VIII's older brother. Prince Arthur died less than a year after their marriage, and Catherine would eventually become the first of Henry's six wives in 1509. The newly created viol made its debut at the Tudor court in 1505 or 1506 by faith. The ship carrying Philip the Handsome from Holland to Spain shipped wreck off the coast of England. Philip and his household were entertained at Windsor Castle by Henry VII. The Tudors must have enjoyed the viol and Philip's musicians so much 
that two of the three players were later employed by Henry VIII. The introduction of the viol at the Tudor court had a profound impact on the instrument's future. From the court, the viol found its way into cathedral choir schools across the kingdom. As the boys aged out, the young men brought their knowledge of the viol and their playing abilities into adulthood. In less than a hundred years, the viol went from an instrument played exclusively at noble houses to an instrument fit for domestic music making. Late into the reign of Henry VIII, it was discovered that the viol was a perfect instrument for children. Evidence suggests that boys singing in the Chapel Royal were beginning to learn the viol in the mid-1540s. Soon, London's choir schools were filled with boys learning to sing and play viols. The choir boy viol players at Westminster Abbey and St. Paul's Cathedral, amongst others, began to offer their skills at entertainments and religious services in exchange for payment. These choir boy viol players were not all playing the same size instruments. In fact, the term viol does not refer to just one instrument. Rather, the viol is a whole family of instruments or a consort with the same characteristics. The Renaissance is filled to the brim with instrumental consorts, consorts of recorders, consorts of sackbuts, consorts of shams, violins, and consorts of viols, to name a few. In each consort, varying sizes of instruments were needed to play in various registers. Thus, each consort had an instrument for the high register, the medium high register, the middle register, and the low register. In a consort of viols, the instruments playing in each of these registers are called the treble, alto, tenor, and bass. Music written for the consort of viols often included parts for as many as six to eight players. And in order to play this music, the choir schools and domestic music makers often had at least six instruments. References for collections of these instruments, called chests of viols, began appearing in the mid-1500s. The ideal size for a chest of viols contained two treble instruments, two tenor instruments, and two bass instruments, all created by the same builder. These consorts were the most sought after because instruments from the same builder blended well together. Early English viol consorts most likely played polyphonic music originally intended for singing. Ensembles could play both secular and sacred music. It's possible that domestic music makers and the choir boy viol consorts even sang while they played or sang between instrumental pieces. Once the viol consort began to increase in popularity, music written for the viol consorts began to emerge. There were endless possibilities for viol consorts and their audiences to explore. Much of the music on today's program was written towards the end of the reign of Elizabeth I and during the reign of James I. The viol consort grew in popularity during Elizabeth's reign, and its popularity continued throughout James's reign as well. Of particular interest for this pre-concert talk is the music of John Dowland and William Byrd. William Byrd and John Dowland are perhaps the most well-known composers to be featured on episode 11 of our Season at Home series. William Byrd's connections to the court musical establishment began as a choir boy at the Chapel Royal. After his voice broke, Byrd probably continued as Thomas Tallis' assistant until he could find employment elsewhere. In March 1563, Byrd began his new position as organist and master of the choristers at the Lincoln Cathedral. He stayed in that position until probably 1572. In 1572, Byrd returned to the Chapel Royal, now as a gentleman of the chapel. He likely shared the organist's responsibilities and sang when he was not playing. A prominent member of the court's musical establishment, his Catholic leanings finally caught up with him in 1605 when he was excommunicated from the Anglican Church. His position and connections to powerful patrons like Queen Elizabeth I allowed him to keep his head attached to his shoulders. Byrd is particularly known for his sacred vocal music. He can also be credited with further developing English virginalist music. His compositions for instrumental consorts contain standard genres for the era, including dances like pavans and galliards, consort songs, 
and Fantasias. The lone piece by Byrd on this episode, The Queen's Alman, was written and dedicated to Queen Elizabeth I. The melody was popular throughout Europe in the 1590s and was not written by Byrd. Byrd instead used the melody as a basis for his composition. Unlike William Byrd, who was active as a court musician at court, John Dowland never received a court appointment until very late in life. Dowland was an incredibly well-traveled composer. In 1580, at the age of 17, he traveled to Paris with the English ambassador and spent at least four years there. From 1594 through 1596, he traveled throughout Germany and Italy. By at least 1597, he was back in London. In 1598, he finally received a royal appointment, not at the English court, but at the Danish court under Christian IV. In 1606, he left his appointment in Denmark, and by 1610, if not earlier, he returned back to London. By the time Dallin returned to London, he was one of the most famous musicians in Europe. Nevertheless, it would take until 1612 for him to receive a position at the English court. His appointment was actually created by a special order which enlarged the band of court lutenists from four players to five. The position was created by Thomas Howard, the father of his patron, Theophilus Howard. The pieces by Dowland that we're performing on this episode come from a collection he printed in 1604. The collection was dedicated to Anne of Denmark, the wife of James VI and sister of Christian IV. The collection contains, as the title notes, lacrimae, or seven tears figured in seven passionate pavons with diverse other pavons, galliards, and almonds for lute, viols, or violins in five parts. The collection was printed in a table layout, and as that name suggests, it was designed to be placed on a table with the players surrounding the book to play their assigned parts. It's unclear why Dowland chose this format instead of the more common part book printing, where each part is printed in separate books. The seven lacrimae pavons appear to be variations on a previous lacrimae pavon written in the 1580s or 1590s. Dowland published that pavon as Flow My Tears in his 1600 collection entitled Second Book of Songs. Apart from that, Little is known about what significance the Latin titles of each of the seven pavons might have. Our selected lacrimae pavon for this episode, Lacrimae Antiqua Nove, is translated to mean old tears made new. The viol is perhaps one of the most fascinating Renaissance instruments still performed today, and it would be safe to say that no instrument family enjoyed such long-lasting popularity until the violin became more mainstream in the mid-17th century. I hope that we've illustrated just how popular the viol was in England during the late 16th century and into the 17th century. The unique sound of the viol and the plethora of music written for viol consort provides ample performance opportunities for professionals and amateurs alike. For the time being, we hope you enjoy our journey to Renaissance England in Season at Home episode 11, Music of England.